Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the third meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Before we begin, can I remind everyone that social distancing measures are in place across the campus and in committee rooms, so please observe these uh, social me measure distancing uh, measures when entering and leaving the committee room. I welcome Colette Stevenson to the committee. Item one of the committee agenda this morning relates to declarations of interest. Colette is here as a committee substitute for Natalie Don, MSP. For agenda item one, can I ask Colette to indicate, indicate whether she has any relevant interest to declare? Thank you, convener, and I'm delighted to be part of um, the committee, albeit on a temporary basis. But in terms of any relevant interest, the only one that um, I will declare at the moment is that I'm currently a councillor for South Lanarkshire Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colette. Today's uh, main business at committee is an evidence session in relation to the Just Transition Commission. But before we hear from our guests, uh, the first item, Agenda 2, is to agree consideration of Agenda Items 4 and 5 in private. Agenda Item 4 is consideration of the evidence session we will hear, and Item 5 is consideration of our approach to the scrutiny of a legislative consent memorandum on the UK Environment Bill. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Items four and five will be taken in private. The committee will now take evidence from two former members of the Just Transition Commission. This evidence session is an opportunity to explore the main findings of the commission and seek views on the next steps for the Just Transition Agenda and the objectives towards net zero. I'm delighted to welcome Professor John Ski, former chair of the Just Transition Commission and Professor of Sustainable Energy, Centre for Environmental Policy, and <clears throat> Dave Moxham, former member of the Just Transition Commission and Deputy General Secretary of the Scottish Trades Union Congress. Uh, we are delighted that you could both take time out uh, this morning and join us. Thank you very much. Broadcasting will operate your camera and microphone, so there's no need for you to do anything on your end. Professor Ski, I understand you have a brief opening statement before we move to questions, so I will uh, hand over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, ju just ve very briefly, convener, and just to say how much we, I think, appreciate the chance uh, to, to meet uh, with, with, the, with the committee. I uh, mean, net zero by 2045 is an incredibly ambitious target, and that means the how you get there is also very, very important. So the justice part of the just transition concept, I think, is really, really important for a principled reason and a pragmatic reason. I mean, the principled reason, I think it represents the kind of country that Scotland wants to be. But pragmatically, we will not get the buy in for net zero by 2045 unless people are bought into it and actually are given a chance to sort of lead, lead and give a sense of direction. I'd like to pay tribute, actually. It was a great, great privilege to be invited to actually chair the, the Commission. And I'd like to pay tribute to my fellow Commissioners, who certainly have strong points of view on particular matters. But uh, honestly, people worked really well together. They strove for consensus right from the beginning. So every word of the report that, come, that, you know, that came out was bought into by every member of the Commission. It was very much a, a consensus exercise. One other point I, I think I'd like to make, just to open it up, is just to say we've well, got 26 coming up. Uh, what Scotland has done with Just Transition has caught a lot of international attention. I mean, I've been doing presentations in Brussels, Scandinavia, Switzerland, and also in the US. And really, I mean, Scotland is perceived to be quite world leading. It has caught a lot of attention internationally, which is worthwhile bearing in mind uh, as we go into COP26. But of course, uh, th this then creates uh, questions about expectations management. In some ways, uh, the Just Transition Commission 1.0 was the easy part of the job. The big challenge now is delivery and actually making it happen. And obviously, the fact that Richard Lockhead has been appointed as a, as a Minister for Just Transition is a very important first step to pull that together. But how that is made more concrete in the future, I, I think, it is, going to, it is going to be very important. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish my opening remarks there. 
Thanks very much, uh, Professor Ski. That's a, a very useful introduction, and I'm sure you've covered a, a number of uh, points that members will want to pursue in questions. Let, let me uh, kick off with the first question. Um, as you said, there's been a significant amount of discussion around the need for the managed transition to achieve net zero climate targets in Scotland. The Just Transition Commission issued a series of general recommendations to the Scottish Government in March of, of this year, setting out four key messages. We, as you will know, we have the programme for government being announced this afternoon. We don't know what's in the programme for government, but what, what specific actionable policies and plans would you like to see being implemented by the Scottish Government over the next two, three years um, that will really address and take us towards net zero? And if, in your answer, if you could touch on some of the key sectors, the economic sectors that you think need to be prioritised that would be fantastic. And perhaps, Professor Ski, I can start with you uh, and then turn over to, to Dave. Thank you. Yeah, well, our, our first set of uh, recommendations were about the importance of a planned transition on the basis that an unplanned transition is likely to be an unjust one. And I think one of the key recommendations was the notion of planning at the sectoral level uh, to make sure that everybody, you know, both uh, employers, employees, affected uh, uh, stakeholder groups, understand which direction that you, you're actually wanting to go. In terms of the, you know, the sectors that are an absolute priority, I think it, it would be hard to ignore the question of oil and gas and the issue around the northeast as a key issue, which you know Dave may want to may want to come in. That is going to be very very important. And I think many members of the Commission were also, I, I think, struck by the challenges in the rural economy and the land sector and agriculture, uh, not just the, the the industrial part of it, where some very big challenges there. And I, I've had the, the chance to speak uh, you, you know, with the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy uh, as well in the last few weeks. And I think you know, this is recognised as a, as a very particular challenge. I think uh, you know, one of the other things, of course, that the, the Scottish Just Transition Commission did, which is not so common in other countries in the world, is to focus on the consumption side of the economy and the consumer end as well. And I think we have to be very aware uh, that you know some aspects of uh, you know the, the transition to net zero need paid for, and the way that the dis these costs are going to be distributed, I think, is going to be incredibly important as well. And that was our fourth area of recommendation line: that the, 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 the who bears the costs, uh, where where does the burden, if there is one, fall? Remembering, of course, there are many opportunities. It's not all just burden; there are opportunities as well. Thank you very much for that. And Dave, uh, I noticed you wanted to come in, in, in on that as well. Yeah, uh, thanks very much indeed, and thanks to the committee uh, for having me. I concur with um, all of the content of Jim's introduction and also um, his answer to your first question. Um, clearly, you know, I mean, Jim's right. We need a roadmap um, or a set of roadmaps that cut across every major sector of the economy, so you know, an example would be a plan for energy just rather than a plan for oil and gas. Some of that's mirrored um, already in, in action being taken um, by government. And within those sectoral plans, particularly when we come to see some of the big players, um, we also need an expectation. And again, this is happening to some extent in industry, but it needs to happen more quickly. Um, we need to see at a subsectoral level um, adjust transition plans from individual companies and at every level, and the Just Transition Commission is very clear about that. Um, there needs to be a seat at the table for, for workers through their trade unions, but also fundamentally uh, for uh, effective communities as well, particularly where transition may um, involve um, regional um, inequities. Um, it's hard not to concentrate on the three or four high emission sectors. There has been, you know, some progress, although there's um, still um, particular progress to be made on energy. But we have to recognise that both in buildings and heat uh, and in transport, we really haven't um, got off the mark yet. So in both of those two key sectors, we're going to need to see some you know, immediate and swift actions. You know, we saw a good example from the Just Transition Commission's perspective of uh, movement on um, ADL, Alexander Dennis um, buses. 
Um, we need to roll out quickly um, some of the um, uh, retrofitting uh, strategies, we would argue, uh, from the SGUC perspective through the public sector, but at the same time not keep our not lose our eye off some of the longer term developmental opportunities, the areas where potentially in sectors we still have um, first mover um, advantage in some of the developing technologies, particularly um, in oil and gas. So it's, you know, there's an awful lot to do, but it's very much a question of what we can do quickly um, and effectively um, early whilst not losing, um, not losing our focus on the, uh, on the long-term developmental opportunities in some key. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, and uh, you, you, you both touched on a number of points that, that my fellow committee members will, will, will pursue. The one area I wanted to follow up on was um, the, the, the retraining, the massive retraining um, the, and, and skills that will be required f to equip the workforce for, for the future trends in this area. That's one of the four key messages, one of the bits of advice you gave to the government uh, in, uh, earlier this year. We, I also looked at the STUC report published in 2019 that highlighted that the number of jobs predicted in the low carbon and renewable sector um, ha haven't materialised for, for a number of different reasons, and that domestic Scottish-based supply chains haven't materialised either in the way that was uh, uh, expected. Uh, perhaps I could start with you, Dave. Um, what, what do you think we need to do differently? What, what different policies and actions do we need to, uh, to, to take to make sure that the kind of future jobs in this area, technology-driven jobs, are created and remain in Scotland? Um, there's uh, potentially quite a lot there. Um, if I look, um, I guess, particularly at the low-carbon and renewables um, sector, I mean, what's clear, and there's no... You know, this goes back further than any um, uh, current government. What's clear is there hasn't been um, a manufacturing uh, and industrial plan to go along diet um, decarbonisation. Um, we are, frankly, in last chance saloon when it comes to some of the subsectors within, uh, for instance, offshore um, wind where we still believe it's possible to retain and, and promote um, the manufacturing construction part of the uh, uh, offshore um, wind uh, 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 expansion, but we really are in absolute last chance saloon. Um, this is one area where those roadmaps that we talked about and those sectoral plans are absolutely vital. It's going to, in our view, um, involve um, government intervention and support, similarly, similar to, but hopefully more proactive than um, the situation um, at BIFAB. It's also going to require um, changes at a UK government level, so we're, we're, we're waiting for the outcome of the contracts for difference consultation, which is taking place at Westminster, and we're very hopeful that the outcome of that will be an ability for government at the end of the day as, the, um, as, as, as partially the purse string holder to dig into far more detail um, about how the delivery of 60% um, um, content in um, uh, 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 offshore um, supply chains and can actually be, be delivered on the ground. And as part of that, um, action at a UK level, the uh, introduc introduction of a, a, a roadmap and a sector plan in Scotland um, to, um, to, to really bring about um, a realisation and a buy-in from some of the big corporate players about what the expectations will be of them in the decades coming as we develop our our offshore um, uh, capacity further. Uh, I, I realise I'm taking up quite a lot of time, but just to touch on the skills uh, recommendation within the Just Transition uh, Commission report, I mean, this skills guarantee we think is absolutely vital. It provides um, at the base level of some level of security for workers who are currently being you know, asked to consider um, transition. Um, we think there's significantly more portability um, of skills um, than the uh, system currently um, uh, is affecting. Uh, and the other side of that is regulation. You'll, you'll rarely hear a trade unionist talk about um, less regulation, but there can definitely be some smarter regulation in areas such as uh, health and safety certification for offshore 
oil and gas workers um, as they move uh, and, trans and transition to other energy sectors. Thanks very much, Dave. And uh, please f feel free to make your, your answer as long as you think necessary uh, to, to address the issue. And, and you, you, you raised a number of really important points there. Professor Skeel, I'd like to bring you in on this question as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I very much agree with all, all the points that uh, Dave has made. And, I th you know, I think to, to deliver on this, I mean, there are two sides to the, to the question. And Dave has rightly mentioned uh, at the UK level the contracts for difference mechanism and the way that that has not helped us, helped us in, in the past and the way that it's operated. But just to flag that even if it's reformed to some degree to, you know, to, to help deliver better on local content, there still will be competitive tensions in that kind of process. So it's very important that uh, you know Scottish yards and Scottish enterprises are in a position to bid successfully into the kind of competitions that come along, which is where all the you know the, the skills, uh, the retraining, etc., are going to be really important and investment uh, in the in the facilities. One thing just to add on the sector plans, and this is building a bit on the experience I had when I was a member of the UK Committee on Climate Change, you know, developing ad advice for Scotland. Uh, the importance in planning of uh, developing milestones and targets, uh, which are, are ownable by, by specific people to take it through. And if you look at uh, the more procedural kind of recommendations that the committee made, I mean, obviously the first one for a minister for just transition has happened. The second one was, was that we recommended that there was a continuing need for advice and scrutiny of, of, of government's progress. And that is where benchmarks and measuring progress against benchmarks and providing that kind of scrutiny, I, I think, can, can help move you in the, the right direction so that there isn't really an opportunity to take your foot off the accelerator. You need to keep working on these things and have uh, milestones to work against. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me bring in Fiona Hislop, who I believe wants to follow up on some of these issues. Fiona. Yes, I want to, to uh, focus on industrial uh, transitions. Uh, can I thank you for the, the work of the Commission and indeed um, the National Mission Report and the fact that this is the, the second meeting of this committee we wanted to hear from you, I think, is evidence of the importance we place on just transition. Um, you've talked about the, the sectoral approaches, and we know the 2045 target is going to be tough. The 2030 is even tougher. Um, you've talked about tensions. Um, and we know that it might, that to deliver on some of these targets, focus on one sector as opposed to another may be an imperative. So how do you see that sectoral approach, bearing in mind you calling for uh, just transition plans in each of the sectors, and what would your advice be in trying to make sure that we raise the game for all sectors, but at the same time try and meet those targets? Jim, you ask um, Professor Jim Skier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for that for, for that challenging challenging question. I mean, I, I think it's really important important to keep reminding ourselves uh, that there is no single answer or no single sort of technique or sector that's going to get us to net zero by 2045. It absolutely needs action right across right across the uh, right across the field. I mean, no sector can kind of miss out on it. So I think in terms of you know picking out individual sectors, it's a question of which ones it, it, you need to work on urgently because they're facing big challenges now. And oil and gas and the energy sector is the obvious one, uh, the obvious place to place to start. But unless we do transport uh, and, and other aspects of it, unless we do buildings which are incredibly um, important, we are just not going to get there. You just look at uh, you know the numbers that the UK Committee on Climate Change looks at what would net zero in Scotland look like in 2045, and we're basically looking at emissions from transport and buildings being eliminated, uh, you know, by by that time, and that just gives you a sense of uh, you know, the the level of ambition that is needed. And mind yourself that the, the, there are, are big opportunities that, there. I mean, in terms of the building sector, j just shines out as one in which there's a triple win in terms of you know dealing with fuel poverty, getting emissions down, but also the fact if you go for deep retrofits of buildings, you are actually going to need to upskill uh, you know the, the workers to, to try to get the measures in. So we shouldn't leave these aside, and we don't have time to leave them aside. You know, with the 2030 target, as you rightly point out, that is. Uh, 
almost more more ambitious than the, than the net zero by 2045. So nothing needs to be to be left off the table. One thing that the the Commission did debate a bit, uh, you know, when it was doing when it was uh, working up the recommendations, was whether there should be an overall economic plan. Uh, for net zero by 2045, or whether you started building it up from the bottom up, sector by sector. And we decided to make the recommendation based on sector by sector plans because it would, we thought it would take too long to get an economy wide plan together and then sort of you know, have it trickle down to individual sectors. So we were very, very keen on the idea that we got on with things where there was obvious actions needing to be taken. And the energy sector has been emphasised, I think, for that reason. We kind of know what needs to be done there, so let's get on with it. Some of the other sectors are going to be a bit more challenging, but that doesn't mean we leave them to one side. Um, can I maybe ask uh, Dave Moxham and then um, uh, Professor Skew might want to come in on this. I know other colleagues will want to come on to specific sectors, but um, I'm interested in how the, the how and the delivery, and if we're going to do particularly skills and reskilling as, as central to this. Uh, we've gone through an experience over the last year where we've probably had unprecedented uh, work between uh, unions and employers in terms of dealing with the pandemic. That approach of trying to bring um, employers and unions together to try and tackle this and to come up with skills transition strikes me as something that could be very positive. Um, but in terms of um, the idea of the mapping um, of different skills in different sectors, a lot of skills and retraining is very individualised now. There's a lot of uh, private providers that do that on an individual basis and responsibilities for individual um, uh, you know, work, you workers themselves in different sectors to do that. So how do we do that on a collective basis? And particularly looking at some of the, dare I say, that there are interests and understandably historic vested interests in some of that protection of the standards that are required in different sectors to, to make sure we've got the high standards to work in very, quite often very challenging circumstances. So what, what's your advice as to how we can make sure as part of these individual sector transitions, we can try and make sure that skills and skills retraining um, is is uh, developed in a way that is meaningful, bearing in mind it looks as if there's money there and there's resource there and there's commitment, but it's the how and the delivery. So if I can ask uh, Dave first and then if we can come to, to Jim after that. Uh, uh, thanks very much indeed, um, Fiona. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess part of my answer is slightly repetitious in the sense that, you know, I do think that we need um, company level um, just transition agreements and skills should be, you know, an integral um, part of that. So we do need um, employers to step up to the plate. I don't personally believe, I mean, you, you, you're right to point out, I think, that, you know, there is, a, you know, to a degree, a bit of individualization of the skills offer, um, and there's quite a varied um, uh, geography um, in terms of the commitment of different um, employers uh, to delivering on workplace skills. Um, but I do think that with, you know, with the growing imperative, with the expectation that um, major employers will, you know, have a role both in terms of their individual transition plan and also the sexual plan that the, the architecture is there to do it. Um, I wouldn't want, and I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if this was your interpretation, it certainly wasn't my meaning to suggest that there should be any downgrading of necessary skills or qualifications. Um, I just think that at the moment the we're missing opportunities in terms of potentially um, creating the type of uh, skills training that is suitable for people who already have a significant number of the competences that are required and, you know, um, will require top up. Um, I also think, and again, this, this comes a little bit back to the, um, you know, if you like your former question about which sectors and, you know, and when, that we do need to align our skills um, uh, delivery, you know, to specific government and industry investments in specific areas. So Jim spoke quite rightly about deep retrofit. I mean, for us, deep retrofit, you know, the only issue with deep retrofit is 
how fast can we go because of available capital um, capital spending opportunities and, uh, and the revenue situation. There's very few people anywhere who would disagree with the idea that deep retrofit is going to be necessary as quickly as possible and to as much scale as possible. Um, so the idea, it seems to me, there is to make an ambitious, although it would necessarily need to be a realistic commitment to work in that sector, to you know, to assess the, the current skills that are out there, the skills that are needed, and then to ensure that we have a really, really well dovetailed approach to how those skills are delivered with a combination of those being at a workplace and a college level. But for me, it's about ensuring that the, the skills plan fit with the sector plans and that we're very um, ambitious, but at the same time realistic of what that's going to look like over the next four or five years. And, and Jim, if you can maybe just comment on that, and particularly yeah, some... yeah, yeah. D Dave is much better informed on the, on on the detail of, of this type of issue, much more informed than I am. But m maybe just one what one general you know kind of observation. You know, a knowledge based net zero economy is going to have a much larger of resource put into training and reskilling than we've probably probably uh, seen seen in the past. And you, you mentioned, you know, the issue of vested interests. I, I, I think in, in your in your initial question, I think it is rather it is incredibly important, uh, you know, as it were, to bang heads together in terms of those the, the bodies that are providing the training and doing the certification and bringing them together. Almost the sectoral plan for trainers, so that they have an idea about what the big prize is in terms of a net, a net zero economy and don't focus on trying to protect particular areas of interest. So I think having that larger scale idea of, of, of you know, where, what we're trying to do in terms of shifting, shifting the economy, I think would be quite helpful and bringing together the people that are providing that training and certification. I spent two years as president of the Energy Institute, uh, you know, that does does a lot of, of that kind of activity. And that is the kind of body, I mean, bodies like that are beginning to grasp the idea that you need to look at skills right across the energy sector, not have oil and gas skills in one place and renewable energy skills someplace else. Because so many of the skills are transferable and there are artificial obstacles at the moment uh, that need to be overcome. Thank you. Thank you. We can maybe explore that a bit more if you, or if you want to follow up. Thank you. Liam Kerr has a supplemental in this area. Just very briefly, and, and on that line of questioning, if I may, because Dave, you talked about uh, college. You, you mentioned college in passing. Now, uh, there must be a requirement for specific courses uh, to aid any transition, uh, and, and furthermore, for lecturers to deliver them. Uh, now, it seems to me that that needs to happen up front, uh, because in order to drive a transition, you need those courses to be being delivered and for people to be coming out of them. Uh, so is there any evidence that that is happening at the moment, that those courses are, are coming in place and that there are the lecturer skills uh, being put in place to deliver them? Uh, or is it stalled waiting for a plan on what a transition looks like? And if so, uh, doesn't there need to be some action taken very, very quickly indeed? Um, you've, uh, you've tempted me um, into, uh, into the answer, which is towards the, I guess, the latter, um, the, the latter part of your question, which is, um, I do think we need significant action um, in the college sector, and that includes um, funding and alignment. But, you know, I mean, we, we recently published um, uh, a Green Jobs report that I'm happy to, um, uh, to furnish to committee with if it hasn't had the opportunity um, to see it yet. And what that makes absolutely clear is that there are a, an enormous array of potential choices within most of our uh, high emission sectors um, about what we do next. And yes, some of those decisions, both in terms of kind of scale and direction, are going to need to be taken now. Um, and um, uh, that is, in, in my view, the information that, that the college, the further education sector in particular, but obviously the university sector too, is going to need to have. So, you know, if you, you know, the easy answer to the question is both things um, need uh, to happen at once. But if you're offering me a chicken or an egg, 
then for me, the chicken is some of those strategic sectoral decisions uh, about where investment is going to go, uh, um, you know, where we're going to uh, be putting our R and D, um, and where we're going to be introducing, um, you know, quicker, more what we might call shovel-ready projects, um, which are going to need um, a swifter response um, from the training sector. Um, it, it's hard to speak, you know, specifically um, around this, but you know, you know, you know, as part of the Just Transitions uh, Commission's work, we, um, uh, you know, we, you know. We, we did look in some detail at the uh, offering of um, various colleges, and we were, you know, over in uh, uh, Central um, College, which is, of course, where um, Grangemouth sits, isn't really that too far away from places like um, BIFAP. And, you know, we're going to need a really clear roadmap of what the intentions are for somewhere like um, uh, 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 Grangemouth. If the college sector is going to be in a position to respond to the um, transition skills needs that are um, that are going to be presented um, uh, by such you know major industrial areas with currently very high emissions. Thanks very much for that. Uh, let me bring in Mark Roskell to be followed by Monica Lennon. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, morning to you both. Um, I was really pleased to see the just transition principles embedded in the Climate Act um, and really pleased to see the, the Commission set up as well, although not on a statutory basis. Um, do you think, though, that there's perhaps a concern that going forward just transition is interpreted in the same way that sustainable development is interpreted? In other words, there's a thousand different flavours of it and whether you're sat on the board of an oil and gas company or whether you're in a community affected um, by a major development, you, you know, you'll have a very different perspective and a very different point of view. And it sort of comes back to whether you think just transition and, and the work that you've started can actually deliver a real systemic change that's required, or whether it's still predominantly about mitigating climate impacts. It's about building more efficient kit. It's about putting in carbon capture and storage onto existing plants rather than making a wholesale change. So it, it, interested to get your, your kind of sense of where the discussions are around just transition and perhaps more importantly, who's leading those discussions? Yeah, maybe if, if I can, can comment on that, first of all, I mean, there is a big risk uh, that the words just transition are used as a kind of magic dust that you sprinkle on net zero policies to make it seem socially and, and economically benign. And we, we really have to, I, I think, to move it beyond uh, the, the generalities. Uh, and, and just to say, I mean, one of the, the big challenges we have, I mean, just transition does not uh, trip easily off the lips of, of just ordinary people. I mean, we had surveys done of oil and gas workers, for example, to ask how many of them had heard of the idea of just transition. And it was a very, very small number, which is why I think we'd also want, in, in terms of communicating the idea of just transition, to talk about concepts of fairness and not unburdening people unfairly. The word fair is incredibly important to you, you to, to make it more general. but. Um, just, just to say, I mean, I think we're, at, we're at actually at quite a critical point in this because we do need to move it on from the principles and the generalities on to making it practical, which is why when the, we were asked by ministers to come up with re, uh, you know, realistic, practical recommendations, we took that very seriously. And there's only so much we could do in, the first, in that phase of the Just Transition Commission. But the next phase is absolutely essential to make it concrete and specific. And I mentioned the idea of sectoral planning, targets for individual sectors you know, which, uh, you know, to which people could be held accountable. And I think unless that kind of thing is done, it, you know, it, it's not going to move us on. I might say, because you know, I'm spending a lot of time internationally as well, that the concept of just transition has got quite well embedded. Um, you know, the IPCC report I'm currently working on has plenty of recommendations of just transition, including, as I recall, uh, the occasional reference to the Scottish just, just transition uh, you know, initiatives. So it is beginning to catch fire internationally, and there is a committee of the Convention on Climate Change that looks at just transition, though not in that kind of language. So 
I think it's the kind of idea, you know, we're very much in the early phases, but I think the idea is beginning to catch fire a bit. And I hope the work of the Just Transition Commission has helped it on, not only stating general principles, but giving it some sort of kind of practical kind of implementation dimension to it. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I mean, we've had the Grange Mouth Future Industries Board. Um, that, that's one practical example of where there's been a conversation, I think, predominantly led by the industrial cluster there, perhaps rather than the community itself. I'm just wondering what your views are on how we roll out then just transition plans for individual sectors within individual communities. I mean, you'll be aware of community concerns in Moss Moran, for example, around the ethylene plant there. And, and you know, perhaps a different context to, to Grangemouth in that that conversation is being led by the community itself um, rather than the operators who seem to be reluctant to have a discussion at all. So like, a very different starting point, but how would you see a just transition plan, for example, working for that particular site, uh, which is the third biggest carbon polluter in, in Scotland, as compared to what you've had with the Grange Mouth Future Industries Board, which has been very much corporate-led, corporate-driven. Yeah, without ducking out of it, I think Dave may be in a better position to answer that. I'm trying to read Dave's expression to see if he's willing to, to pick that one up. Well, at the um, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Jim, and thanks, Mark. Um, I mean, at the core level, and this may seem fairly simple, but as you um, identify in your question, it doesn't always happen. Um, if you like, three parties need to be at the table, which is the, the workers affected, the community affected. I mean, one could argue for if one includes government, obviously, uh, the companies affected too. So that should be, um, you know, that should be the absolute and core criteria. No company, no cluster who is considering um, and agreeing a just transition plan should do so and should be allowed to do so um, in terms of any form of government support that it receives, whether that's direct funding, whether that's planning support or skills support or all the range of different levers that government has. None should be able to, all should be required to have a plan and none should be able to, um, uh, to develop and state that they have an agreed plan um, unless both those employed and the community is affected um, are significantly part of that discussion and as we all know, um, the the way in which consultation and you know genuine empowerment um, is undertaken uh, is as important as as the fact that it appears to to have taken place on the outside. So we're not talking about you know quick community surveys here or one-off meetings between management and union. We are talking about deliberative processes where all voices are brought to the table, and in my in my view, where sign-off should be required from um, um, from all parties. So that would be a, a fairly fundamental change, but I would argue um, a necessary change. Um, and some of those things need to happen, you know, at pace. Um, you know, but to return to the conditionality point, um, you know, these should not be considered to be good practice additions. These should be um, considered to be absolute, absolutely fundamental um, to the ongoing relationship between development agencies, uh, government, local authorities, um, and the employer. Um, if all of the assistance that are provided through the public sector to such companies um, uh, are going to continue to be delivered. So what, were the community and unions involved in the Grangemouth industry cluster? No, um, no. And um, one of the um, recommendations, uh, uh, one of the major concerns in our recent report was that that, you know, was that that didn't take place. Um, and, um, you know, it's a fundamental miss. You know, I think Ross Moran is, is a really important example here, Mark. I mean, the, the, um, you know, the, uh, the perceived needs of the workforce and the perceived needs of the community may not be the same in that situation. Um, there may be some similarities in position between between the company and you know and the workforce. You know that's those are the hurdles of just transition. Those are the meat that we need to get into. Those are the problems that we need to resolve. 
Um, but, you know, avoiding, uh, you know, in the case of uh, Grangemouth, avoiding, you know, the difficulties of previous industrial relations, difficulties, avoiding tensions between, you know, communities and uh, and, and employers may be the easy route, but it's not the just transition route, and it doesn't get us anywhere to ignore those stakeholders. Because I think, you know, to return to the premise of your original question, otherwise just transition is just a word. If just transition isn't hard um, and friction um, giving and difficult at times, then it clearly won't be doing its job. Because if it was an easy answer, we'd all have found it already. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, Monica Lennon, please. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning to, to Dave and to, to Jim. Um, last week, we heard from the, the Climate Change Committee and we've been looking at their recent carbon budget, which highlights the needs for significant investment in order to reach net zero. And whilst CCC modelling shows savings in surface transport and energy production, there will also be costs in areas such as homes and industry. Um, I'm interested to hear your views and how this can be managed and mitigated to spread the costs and benefits fairly, and in particular, how we can make sure that, that everyone can afford to make their, their, their home energy efficient. Um, what I've taken from today so far is that a just transition has to be principled, but it also has to be pragmatic and uh, practical. So I'm interested to, to hear your views. Yeah, no, no, no. That, that that really gets gets to the heart heart of the matter. I mean, it, it's fair to say that the bulk of you know the expenditure that's taken place so far on decarbonisation in Scotland and in other parts of the UK has been paid for by electricity uh, consumers. Effectively, you know, it's come through electricity bills, and that has uh, you, you know you, you can certainly make the case, and we made the case in the Just Transition Commission report. That that is, you know is is regressive. That means the costs are following on higher on particular groups of people. Uh, for example, people on lower incomes or people who have to use electricity as the as the as their form of heating. And I think it needs a. My personal view is it needs a much bigger exploration of how that is paid for. Whether you know general taxation or other or spreading it more evenly across other forms of energy uh, would would it would actually would actually be fairer. And of course, we may have an announcement on national insurance uh, that, that this afternoon that uh, that uh, has other kinds of regressive uh, Im Im implications. So I think you know, addressing that you know, that who pays bit of it and care, thinking carefully about what the mechanism is is going to be important. Um, I, I, I think also worthwhile saying that, that you need to think about different groups. I mean, Scotland has done very well in terms of social housing, for, for example, in terms of improving energy efficiency, where there is you know, a kind of a, a clear public sector mechanism for making sure that funds are directed in the right kind of way. Uh, the, there are also mechanisms available in the private rented sector. You know, for example, when tenancies switch over using regulatory means to, to to try and get things switched over. But frankly, the most difficult sector is going to be the owner-occupied sector for housing, where you're asking everybody to come up with the, with their own amount of money. And and, and you know, we, we've really said that people, if people can pay, they should pay. For it, you know, there, there, there are differences there, and how we get the incentives to work uh, work uh, fairly is going to be good. My own view is that, uh, you know, for example, grant you know, mechanisms like grants or very low interest loans are potentially the way that will encourage owner occupiers to switch over, where you don't have the kind of regulatory levers that are in place for either social housing or the private rented sector. I do think that's going to be the toughest one one to move it, because you will be expecting to, to some extent, people to reach into their own pockets to finance the transition. Uh, okay, for me to come in, uh, Monica. Hi, yeah, hi, Dave. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a bit of an elephant in the room here, and you know, understandably, um, you know, beyond uh, recommending you know, the marshalling of um, public and private resources and recognising the need for general in, uh, uh, increased investment, I guess the, um, the Just Transition Commission doesn't go as far as the SGUC certainly goes, you know, we are not even in the 
right ballpark at the moment in terms of the levels of public investment that we need. I mean, that's that's an easier thing to say than it is to you know to suddenly um, you know magic up the type of investment that we're going to re require. But we we really do have to start from the position that we need massively increased public investment. Some of that is possible in Scotland. Some of that would become more possible with increased borrowing powers, and a lot of that would become more possible if we had a more, um, if you like, a Biden-style approach to, um, to, to investment um, at, a UK, at a UK level. But that's going to have to happen. And, you know, whether we take that political decision now or, you know, in a few years' time or as things get more acute, that's going to have to happen. At the point that public investment increases, uh, which obviously brings with it um, an increased level of capital debt, we're going to have to work out how we sustain that. Now, the SUC's argument is fairly clear. We, we see enormous opportunities for economic growth, um, and that growth um, would obviously fund an awful lot of that indebtedness. But when it comes to, if you like, the, the specific of the specific of your question, who pays for you know, the elements of that transition that aren't paid for by general growth, then that has to be a matter for, for general and progressive taxation. We, you know, we are at the end of the point, and I think Jim got pretty close to agreeing with this position, we're at the end of the point where certainly when it comes to bills and bills which are spread across you know uh, areas of few poor scotland uh, that they can be sustained by um uh, by the consumer you know, and part of the whole message of the just transition commission is this is a national mission and the national mission has benefits that far outweigh the benefits of an individual householder um, receiving um, you know, lower fuel bills as a consequence of a, uh, of a retrofit program. Um, we would like to see, you know, to use retrofit as an example, although it's not the only one, we would like to see um, standard municipally delivered retrofit. Um, you know, it, I'm just about old enough to remember in the 1970s when we, you know, shifted over a couple of years from non-natural to natural gas, which, you know, took the, um, you know, which meant millions upon millions of um, boilers being um, uh, converted. That was a national mission undertaken by a public company. I've never, you know, seen the um, seen the analysis of how well people think that went, but it certainly worked. And that's the level of intervention that we are going to require. When that comes to um, private um, house owners, you know, I tend to agree with Jim. I think that we need to be uh, as generous as we can be um, as a you know, as a society in um, incentivising through grant and other mechanisms people to, to undertake that. Um, but you know, it can be a it can be a harder um, it can be a harder thing to fix where the state isn't necessarily going to be paying for the whole of, in this case, retrofit. You know, but, you know, to return to my, my original point, there's a real scale issue here, and I can understand why governments shy away from that, um, including in Scotland, because, you know, not necessarily all the levers exist, but, you know, at some stage, someone's going to have to stand up and say, this is going to cost a lot of money, and it's going to have to be funded by the people who can afford to pay and not, and not those who can't. Thank you to both of you. Sticking with your point, Dave, about this has to be a national mission, we did touch on the, the role of the private sector and the role of corporations last week, but how important is it for the public sector to show leadership? And just to give an example from the weekend, it was reported in the Scotland on Sunday that some of the venues that will host COP26 um, have some of the worst um, performing buildings in terms of energy efficiency. The Armadillo, for example, um, has got a, a rating of F. Um, now, there could be some good reasons why they've not been able to put in place the improvements that they've been asked to do. But if it's really, really hard for big venues, you know, like the Hydro and uh, the Armadillo, the Science Centre, what chance do, do low-income um, households or small businesses have. So how can we mobilise public sector expenditure? And, and what would true leadership look like from the public sector, both in terms of decarbonising buildings, but also circular procurement? I don't know who wants to go first. I'll let you decide. 
OK, well, my microphone's turned on, so, uh, so, so, so why, why, why do I, I go first? Yeah, I mean, it, it is absolutely important. I mean, the public sector has an absolute obligation, I think, to lead by example, uh, because it's a national mis mission. But as it were, the ringmaster or the ringmistress is, is government and, you know, in trying to pull, pull this all together and, uh, and take it forward. And, and unless uh, you're leading from the front on it, it's not going to work well. So I think, you know, I mean, you've picked up the areas yourself. Energy efficiency of buildings uh, is, an, is a very important one, which the public sector can lead by example. Uh, the question of procurement, if you're, if you're using vehicles, uh, you, you know, for example, making sure that they're electric or, or, or whatever, that kind, that kind of thing, we would work well. We did recommend a fleet of electric buses, I think, as I recall, uh, for COP26 in our Green Recovery Report, for example, as a, as a way of providing an example. And then there's also the issue around, for example, pension funds, public sector pension funds, on their investment policies, which is another area in which I th think the public sector can, can be seen, seen to lead by example. If I might, could I just go back to, to, to your previous question and just follow up on, on one, one thing that Dave said. He was, uh, we, we, we're all getting too many grey hairs and remembering when we moved from uh, town gas to natural gas. But of course, the big difference then was that there was one national company that could go in and do it street by street. Now, if you go into a street, you have different energy, energy suppliers supplying every different residence. And frankly, as we've seen with the, the smart metering campaign, this is not the effective way to, to go about it. You almost need street by street, neighbourhood by neighbourhood approaches to make it work. And I think this needs a lot of attention. If you're going to get the speed and the pace of change, we do need to think about how this is arranged institutionally as well, whether it's possible to do it street by street rather than individual offers to, you know, to in, in individual people individual households, which is pretty much what we have at the moment. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, jump in briefly. I mean, I, if you like, I agree with the direction of your question and Jim's answer. Um, public sector needs to be um, an exemplar here. Now, I don't know if Jim remembers better than me, because probably not because it was a long time ago, but we did take um, some evidence during our first year from NHS Scotland, for instance, and you know, plans that, um, that they were taking in, um, in health boards to bring together um, coherent, um, uh, uh, coherent um, uh, uh, just transition plans or particularly emission uh, reduction plans. And you know, nowhere could it be more important, if you know what I mean, um, uh, than in the health service where you know, we're still seeing you know, disproportionate health impacts, both of you know, poverty, generally fuel poverty specifically, but also you know, environmental, um, uh, uh, um, uh, environmental illnesses um, because of uh, High pollution. So I, you know, I really think that you know all public sector um, areas, but particularly you know um, health boards need rigorous and uh, and monitored plans to ensure that uh, building emissions are being reduced. Because you know, nowhere is it more important in kind of holistic health and just transition terms than it uh, than in areas just uh, like that. But absolutely, we need we need the public sector to be an exemplar here. I've just got one final brief question perhaps just for, for Dave to answer in the interest of time um, just picking up on I suppose climate change as a health and safety issue for workers I just wanted to cover adaptation uh, with you briefly Dave um, what does a, a just transition to a net zero economy mean in relation to adaptation to climate change and resilience and I just wondered from an STUC point of view if maybe you could um, touch on what, what this means in workplaces um, and, and how we can make sure that, that workers really have some influence in terms of the, the changes that we need to see happening. I think it's a really important area and thanks for the question and it's one that doesn't tend to be covered because I suppose for understandable reasons we, we think about the jobs that might be lost or created um, as a consequence of, of the transition rather than the ones which, you know, to use the term that you used, might be adapted but there's a whole area out there in terms of you know going from workplace resilience in the context of climate change so this can be workplaces that are 
already um, feeling the impact um, of, uh, of, of, of weather change, you know, all the way through to jobs which, while they might not be classically understood as climate jobs, mm -hmm. um, are the sort of jobs that can be made greener or simply by their function they can aid the process of um, uh, of decarbonisation, and I'm thinking in terms of you know local work here, uh, you know localised childcare. Um, you know, we really shouldn't think of any job as not being um, in some way impacted by climate change and in some way able to um, to contribute to climate. Uh, reduction. So, you know, what are those workplace measures, and how can employers and, uh, you know, obviously we would say unions or groups of workers who are not yet unionised uh, work together to do this? And um, yeah, and this can go all the way from, you know, union agreed travel schemes, travel to work schemes. Um, you know, we're all already reasonably aware of uh, cycle to work schemes, which, for instance, we we think could be made more accessible to. To lower paid workers so there's a whole suite of policies which is about you know the consumption even before you get in the into the workplace there's a whole suite of skills that workers can learn but are best adopted and um uh, uh taken up if they're being delivered by unions and um, uh, employers together uh, which go towards um uh, you know potential decarbonization of the workplace itself, you know, I bet every single one of us can think of one example where we could have done something which was uh, more carbon friendly in the workplace. You know, the just transition principle extends to this. You know, messages tend not to be very well received if they're um, sent down by diktat by the employer. They're far more likely to be accessible and bought into if they're agreed at the you know, at, uh, at, at workplace level, and if the kind of skills and support, and when necessarily, you know, the time off to train um, is part of a workplace agreement. So there's an enormous amount to be gained from what you might call, you know, the softer side of just transition, where a job is not necessarily a job that is disappearing or being created, but a job that may be being adapted. Uh, and the just transition principle is absolutely fundamental in that kind of adaptation area. Thank you. Well, hopefully we'll see more unionised workplaces. Um, no further questions from me. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, I believe Colette Stevenson has a supplemental question in this area. Yes, thank you. And it's actually to Jim. You touched upon it um, in terms of um, the pension uh, f uh, schemes in terms of the local uh, pension funds. And I suppose I should declare an interest as such because I was previously the chair of Strathclyde Pension Fund and as a member of that previously we had a fiduciary duty to ensure that we were maximising um, the members uh, pension pots but arguably as well you've got the ethical investment element of that so I know um, from Strathclyde Pension Fund we're probably about the 12th biggest um, within the UK but I suppose um, looking at that going forward, how do we balance that? And is that something that you've maybe looked into further and seen how we can actually transition over so that these pension pots are more ethical? Yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 that, that's a great, a great question. And uh, I have to say the Commission, we did not get the chance to go into that, you know, that kind of issue in depth. So, so it's a bit, a, bit of a, a bit of a high level appeal. One observation I would make, you know, from listening to colleagues who watch more, work much more in the financial sector, it's not le necessarily the case that an ethical investment will provide you a poorer return uh, than, than a standard investment at the moment. You might well be better placed to put your money in a renewable energy company or funds that focus on renewables rather than, for example, the oil and gas sector at the moment. So I think it needs a, a long, hard look to see whether the question, do you have to do a trade-off or whether actually investing in a future low carbon economy will actually provide a better return uh, for the people who are paying into the in, into the to to the pension fund i mean i'm i'm a member of a public sector pension fund and i know this is a very large item of of, of debate in the universities fund fund at the uh, at the moment i might say i was also on the on the board of a, a renewables company that uh, the the you know the university's uh, superannuation scheme paid into and I have to say that they did, they got a pretty good deal out of it at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. 
very much, Colette. Uh, Jackie Dunbar, please. Good morning, and thank you, gentlemen, for coming along today. And my questions will be um, based on the, the roundabout fossil fuels, if you don't mind. It probably won't be a big surprise to say um, probably more about the oil and, and gas industry. I think, Professor Skier, you said that will be a, a key issue going forward, and I, I totally agree with you. Can I ask you both, what role do you think that there is for the oil and gas industry in a just, a just transition? And do you think that there should be further investment in new oil and gas projects? Okay, that, that, that's the, the the big question that you, you know that, that's that's facing the, uh, us all. I think. I, th I think in terms of oil and gas companies, I mean, there's a very obvious point that a number of them out there are trying to rebrand themselves. At, at, you know, at, at the moment, you know, Stat Oil becoming Equinor, all, all that, uh, all that kind of thing. And I think, f for me, the point to emphasise in is what are the skills and competences inside the oil and gas sector at the moment that can be redeployed uh, towards assisting you towards a, you know, a low carbon a, a low carbon economy and you you know basically you know the, the, the skills of the oil and gas sector uh, they're very good at uh, you know produce, uh, at getting corrosive liquids and gases through pipes they're good at, man at managing the geology under the surface and they're good at managing big complicated risky technical projects and these are things that are going to are going to be needed as part of a low carbon economy. So, if you're thinking about things like, uh, you know, if, if there's movement towards hydrogen clusters, that's an area in which the oil and gas sector has competences that can be applied. If you are going to capture carbon and store it geologically, the only companies at the moment that have the skill to do that and have the ability to monitor it. As, as, for example, the former Statoil did, uh, you, you know, with its its field in the Norwegian sector, the North Sea, they're the only companies that can do that. So that I think they they do have that uh, you, that that kind of role to, role to play. To emphasise, you know, the the, the, the rebranding of the oil and gas technology centre in Aberdeen, for example, which has moved much more to energy, it's a signal that that sector understands where it wants to go. And I was very struck uh, by uh, something that came out uh, just yesterday. It was a joint uh, article by Fatih Barol, uh, who leads the International Energy Agency, and the Iraq government actually coming together with the Iraq government acknowledging that the age of oil and gas will eventually be over and thinking about how OPEC countries may need to move over. Uh, maybe on, on the second part of your question, you know, you, the, 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 future, the future of oil and gas, and the, the, these are very much personal views, but building on my experience with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, even in scenarios where we limit global warming to one and a half degrees, there is need for some new oil and gas in the system. Because quite clearly, uh, you know, for prime, light vehicles, electrification it pretty much appears to be the way to go. But we still need oil. We'll need it longer for heavy-duty vehicles. It will be needed for, to some extent for aviation, as petrochemicals, lubricants, etc. So there is oil needed in the future, even in low-emission scenarios. And the difficult question, of course, is who will be the last person standing in supplying that oil as we move, move out of it? That is the much more difficult and interesting question for me, which, of course, is the current question that you know, we have in Scotland and, and, and the UK uh, uh, about uh, the, the position. So globally, we still need some more oil and gas. There's, for me, the critical question is who is actually going to be supplying it? Can I ask Dave Moxham a question? Dave, you were mentioning earlier um, about smarter regulation and safety. Um, I took that to mean in the North Sea, was I correct? And if so, could you maybe um, delve a bit deeper about what what kind of things you think smart uh, we could be doing smarter moving forward in regards to safety? Well, um, uh, it, it's more the accreditation of safety courses and what is required for um, an individual to uh, to qualify. For for um, a safety regulation with a new, new industry. The example we were given uh, during the Just Transition um, uh, Commission's uh, deliberations was of um, 
uh, deep sea divers um, within the uh, offshore oil and gas sector who were being required to individually pay £1,500 to ply their trade in the offshore wind sector. Now, um, what was being put to us was that, as you can imagine, the qualification levels that are required of somebody who, you know, dives at the kind of depth in the kind of pressurized circumstances uh, of somebody who services um, uh, an offshore oil and gas installation are probably far in excess or certainly aren't exceeded by what is required um, for um, uh, a similar but um, in not so testing function when it comes to offshore wind but the individuals were still being required to pay 1500 pounds in order to gain um, a new accreditation for the specific sector and their, their position was that as i say you know in terms of the kind of like the whole range of health and safety competencies knowledge you know a high degree of medical um uh, proficiency because as you know you could have a couple of people hundreds and hundreds of feet under the water together in a pressurized circumstance Basically, that there was a complete mismatch in the requirement to pay fifteen hundred pounds and get this new um, uh, uh, and, 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 and get this new certificate where all the competencies already exist. So that was a fairly sharp example of what is being put to us as, to say, the need to redo a course to gain an accreditation very often at the cost of the in individual, which goes a little bit back to the, uh, the question that Ms. Hislop put about the kind of you know, individual nature of the skills offer. Um, there seems to be a systematic job that can be done to make that portability more efficient in terms of how it's um, certificated. Thank you very much. Um, moving forward, uh, what do you think that the Scottish Government um, should do to make sure that opportunities and skills are delivered in time um, so that the carbon intensive sectors don't face an economic downturn and are not behind the competition from overseas. I think that's um, one of the major issues that I'm, that I'm hearing um, in, in my own constituency. Yeah, I think this is maybe one more for Dave than, than for myself. Sorry to, to pass it over, Dave. Um, in a sense, it's, you know, I mean, I think the problem is we're already behind the curve. We're already seeing uh, uh, significant job losses um, in offshore oil and gas. Although it's worth mentioning that although, you know, and whatever trajectory one uses, if one uses the, uh, the oil and gas oil and gas industry is kind of like um, 19, uh, sorry, 2035 projections, or if one sees the decline in offshore oil and gas being steeper, um, than that as a consequence of, of, of market developments and government decisions. Even with the significant fall off in uh, overall numbers, there's still going to be a significant number of people coming into offshore oil and gas, and that's because of the, the demographic of the workforce. So even though numbers will fall, the oil and gas sector still needs to recruit significant numbers of people. Uh, and there's some evidence that that's already providing a difficulty because um, incentivizing young people to move into an industry which they don't necessarily see as um, uh, having a, a, you know, a lifetime job guarantee for them is something of a, of a disincentive. So one of the really important things now is to align the skills offer with the, um, uh, with the kind of development tra trajectory of what we think is going to happen with offshore oil and gas and where it's going to transition to. So, you know, a, a job in off offshore oil and gas today, you know, does it have a future in develop in the development of, um, of CCS carbon technology or hydrogen? Um, how likely is it and in what way to transfer to, um, to being an offshore um, wind uh, a job or various other, you know, various other transition destinations? You know, so the the real job is to is to align the, the skills offer the skills package and project that because as I said hey, the oil and gas industry is still going to need new recruits and project that in a way that people can get some understanding that making the commitment now to offshore oil and gas encompasses a, a, you know, a longer term trajectory which might see them in a different place but still able to, to apply their skills and, uh, and gain a reasonable income as a consequence. 
Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jackie. Liam Kerr to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to continue along the line that uh, my friend Jackie Jumbar has been pursuing, because uh, I think it's such an important one. Uh, Jim, earlier on you said that the words just transition are used as magic dust, uh, and I understand the point you're making entirely, um, but you rightly have gone on to talk about, or you've flagged issues in the practicalities. Now, this morning I was reading a BBC report that said that uh, if Campbell goes ahead, there are 1,000 direct jobs associated with it, 2,000 more in the supply chain and 500 elsewhere in the UK. And it contrasts that, this report that I was reading, it contrasts that with the Viking project, uh, which it describes as a vast new wind farm uh, in Shetland uh, being put together by SSE Renewables. And it says that that would have 35 permanent jobs associated with it. So. The question is, is there an issue here when we talk about a transition? Is there an issue not only with the practicalities of what can be achieved, but also the realities of a transition that we all accept we need to make? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a perfectly fair question. And there are some very hard choices uh, you involve in making that decision. If I can, if I can just refer back to the answer I, I, I made to, to you, to, to, to Ms. Dunbar, there is a big question. If, we, if the world is going to fulfil the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Paris Agreement targets, then there will be less oil and gas used in the future than there is now. It will unambiguously go down. And the question is, you know, who is actually, you know, who is actually, uh, you know, going to be supplying that oil and gas in the future? Is it going to come from the Middle East, where it's probably some of the cheapest oil and gas around? Is it going to come from, you know, getting the, the, the last molecules from mature fields like we have in Scotland? Or is it going to come from, say, some emerging nations like Ghana? in West Africa, which uh, you know, has been, is struggling with its own transition challenge because it had been hoping to use oil and gas revenue to play for you know, basic economic development there. There are really big fundamental and tricky questions. And uh, you know, I think it, you know, it's almost a kind of moral choice you know, at the moment. It's a, it's a very hard, hard question. To, you, you, to, you can't really duck it. You know, is Scotland going, you know, Scotland, sure, sure we could go ahead and do these jobs. But is that coherent with the position that Scotland is portraying as a, as a leader in terms of climate policy for a small nation on the global stage? And you know, I think that's a tough question. It lies in the political domain, and us, you know, looking at the more technical details of it, can't really provide the answer. It's a political decision, I think. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, and I think I listened very carefully earlier on uh, when you were talking to uh, Jackie Dunbar about the, the, the move that oil and gas workers can make into uh, other areas. So, uh, Dave, much earlier on you talked about a move from oil and gas jobs to other energy sectors. Uh, and I understand the point being made, but then I think to myself, well, where is an offshore chef going to find equivalent paying role as a chef onshore? Uh, where is the helicopter pilot going to fly to without an installation to get to? Where is the crew of the platform supply vessel going to work if the vessel does not have a platform to go to? Where is the roustabout going to find equivalent paid work onshore? Uh, because these are not roles that readily map onto something like offshore wind. And the question then becomes, oughtn't the Scottish Government to be addressing those sorts of questions urgently and talking about they, what they want our oil and gas workers to, to retrain into and what green jobs might be available uh, if they are to get the buy-in, which you rightly said earlier, is required. Um, uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, I think, I mean, there's a fundamental truth or at least um, an important partial truth um, to what you say there will never be the intensity of jobs 
um, across the offshore wind sector as there is in offshore oil and gas. We can split, if you like, um, you know, we, we, can, we can split this, I guess, into sort of three or four different components. You've got development stage, and at the development stage of offshore wind, this can be everything from, you know, um, you know, paying the lawyers, the surveyors, you know, this, this, at this kind of area, there are analogous jobs. I wouldn't say they're exactly the same, but they're um, analogous. You then have the construction phase, where at the moment in Scotland with offshore wind, we're completely missing out on. Um, and that, um, but that construction phase does have crossover with offshore oil and gas jobs. Lots of the people who were formerly working at IFAB um, uh, are currently working um, offshore. Um, uh, you then have if you what you might call the logistics and maintenance phase, where there is absolutely no doubt, doubt that offshore oil and gas provides significantly more jobs. It's a significantly different, and in some cases, better pay levels than offshore wind will ever be able to do. So the first thing to do is to accept that reality. When we're talking about transition to offshore um, wind, we're talking about some jobs in some sectors, uh, but not all at the overall level of intensity, which is why we put so much emphasis on the construction phase, which does, you know, without which um, that, that situation um, worsens. So, yes, we then need to be looking at which emerging technologies um, are suitable transitions, so, the transitions, so some of the offshore oil and gas skills will undoubtedly be transferable if we can get first mover advantage in areas such as a CCS um, and hydrogen. But you know, the, the final point of your question um, or, or, or your point remains, there will still be functions from offshore oil and gas which will not be replicated in any of the sectors that I've um, that I've talked about, and that's where the if you like the non-industry transition and the regional approach to providing alternative but not similar employment will have to be will have to be a factor too. Thank you. Uh, a final question from me, convener, if I may. Uh, in your final advice, or in the Commission's final advice, you recommended that the Scottish Government should develop detailed roadmaps and that workers in carbon intensive industries will be supported in accessing, accessing the skills that they require to transition. The Scottish Government hasn't yet done so, and the funding schemes that have been announced lack detail. Uh, is it important, in your view, to have these details and these schemes in place before the Scottish Government takes decisions which could lead to serious problems for workers in the oil and gas industry and in the North East, for example? I, I, I think the, the, you know, the processes need to work in parallel with each other because one needs, one needs to, you, to, to feed off the, off the other. So, I, you know, these sector plans are, are, you know, going to be really, really important uh, to follow through on, and they, they, they must, uh, t you know, be executed and developed in parallel with the, with, with the, the kind of decisions that need to be made. So we wait, you know, for the pro, you know, the program for government, you know, later this afternoon to, you know, to, to see, to see what, what is, is actually in there. On the previous question, just may maybe to add one other point. I mean, it is you know, absolutely unambiguously true that low carbon energy or zero carbon energy is more capital intensive than the oil and gas activities we've seen in the past, which means inevitably that the jobs are concentrated in the construction phase. So obviously, lots of jobs can be created if you're building up a renewable sector, but as you perhaps get to a steady state, the number of jobs that would be required would be going down because you'd only be looking at sort of a replacement activity. And that's a fact that needs to be faced up to, really. In a low carbon world, there will probably be fewer jobs in the energy sector than, than we actually have at the moment. That is, is quite a possible outcome. Uh, the question for me is, I mean, I've, I've mentioned, you know, the activities I've done with the Energy Institute, and every year it runs a, a so-called barometer, a survey of its members to look at issues, and some of them are related to skills. And it is very striking that for the com people in companies who respond to that from the oil and gas sector, they are still far more worried about skills shortages 
on people coming through for the sector, rather than the opposite problem that we we are, are worrying about. So I think there are all sorts of issues about you know the age structure of the workforce, the number of new people that need to come in. And that's exactly the kind of thing where I think some proper analysis and planning is needed to really understand what the, what the, what the impacts would be. We didn't have the time or the resource to do that within the Just Transition Commission over the two-year period. But I think it's very important that these kind of uh, analyses uh, are done as we move forward with the Just Transition concept. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Liam. Mark Roskell has a very brief supplemental in this area, and then I'll bring in Colette Stevenson. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, Jim, you, you co-authored the groundbreaking IPCC report into 1.5 degrees. It's really ignited this whole debate. Where, where do you see oil and gas development? Where do you see Cambo sitting, for example? Is that compliant with our need to keep the world under 1.5 degrees or not? Uh, it's, it's a bit... Overall, I think you need to look at the overall glo global picture. There will be less oil and gas produced in the future under any 1.5 degree, degree scenario, but there is still need for new oil and gas development to compensate for the depletion of existing fields and the fact that there are still residual markets for oil and gas. So, um, whether whether that particular oil field is com is compatible or not is is, all, is a, a, a quite a difficult question to address, and I, I'm not sure I know the answer to it. I mean, I I'm struck by the fact that you know the the oil and gas policy for the UK is to maximise economic recovery from the North Sea, and it's the big question squaring the circle: is that compatible with the climate change objectives? You know, with my more analytical hat on, I would want to home in on the issue of the economic recovery and ask whether, if you take account of the externalities, the climate change implications of producing oil, is that particular field still economic? I don't know the answer to that, and I don't think anybody has, has done that proper analysis on it, which I think would be the driving question for me. If you take account, you know, for example, the Treasury's guidance that we should uh, be valuing carbon dioxide at about 70 or 80 pounds a tonne by 2030, if you factor that in, does that particular oil field still stack up? I don't know the answer, and I don't know if anybody has done the analysis on that. Yep. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, let me bring in Colette Stevenson, please. Okay. Thanks, convener. And, and thanks very much. And I'm going to sort of focus my questions on um, the forthcoming COP26. And um, I suppose you touched upon it, Jim, earlier in terms of, you know, just transition. Um, that internationally, um, everyone's looking at Scotland in terms of transition. So I'm going to sort of tap into that uh, and, and see if you can outline some of it and, and go into it in more detail. So. Um, you talked about the just transition principles and how it's played out in the international climate change negotiations to date. Um, are they properly understood? Are they, you know, have they been accepted internationally? Is there maybe some kind of expectation gap there? Um, it was just to see if you could come in on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, internationally, the you know, the the, the principle the principle ha has been been accepted, though with some pushback from some co some uh, countries. So there's been the typical kind of uh, complicated language. We don't have a just transition committee. We have the CATA commi committee of experts looking at the implications of the implementation of response measures, is what it is clumsily called, because they couldn't bear to call it just transition. Uh, but the Polish, the Polish presidency, when they had it, pushed just transition and made it the central concept. Just transition is mentioned in the preamble to the Paris Agreement, but not in the actual agreement, uh, uh, agreement itself. Um, and I should say that we now have just transition after a bit of struggle. It is actually scoped into the synthesis report, the next IPCC synthesis report. So I can show you just transition is going to get coverage in IPCC you know, as well as in, in, in the formal negotiations. So it's running. Uh, the trade unions are one of the major interest groups uh, that, 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 match, that, that go along to the conference of the parties. 
So the, uh, the International Labour Organization, which leads on that, will be, will be pushing just transition principles. Richard Lockhead and I actually had a meeting with the Icelandic Economic Council last Thursday, along with the president of the International Labour Organization. So I can show you, it, it is very, very high on the, the agenda uh, at the moment, with some pushback in some quarters, but, but, but it, it, it is there. OK. I don't know if Dave wants to come in on that as well. Yeah, I mean, ju just briefly, I mean, so undoubtedly the concept and understanding of just transition has developed over the last couple of years. And I do think that the Scottish Government Just Transition Commission, the debate here in Scotland, has assisted with that. And uh, I guess the change or the, the change that we're undertaking is if you like the original understanding of just transition as being quite compensatory based. So it's the idea, you know, a, a coal mine has to be closed down and, you know, relevant regeneration monies and programs need to be put in uh, to, if you like, compensate that community. And that's an important part and will continue to be an important part of Just Transition. But we're now, I think, moving into the, the space that we need to be in, where that's understood in a much more holistic sense, so that it is a, an economic policy, it is an industrial policy, even if it has subsectors. So that's, I think, the space that we're moving into. I still think that there's um, differences internationally um, between those who see just transition as, um, uh, as something that need not affect the the social and economic relations, you know, of a particular country, uh, but just need to be, you know, stuck on top of it. So, you know, how do we make sure the jobs we create are properly? Um, uh, um, uh, um, you know, are properly dispersed and, uh, and the benefits felt. Again, something which I think, and I think we're getting to it, but we haven't got to yet in Scotland, and understanding that this will actually challenge some of the very relations within, within society itself. So how community democracy relates to the industry that, um, uh, that it sits within, how trade unions engage with employers. Some of these kind of more structural elements of just transition are being developed, but, but haven't got there yet. Um, it's certainly from my point of view in terms of what transition really should mean. OK, thanks. Thanks for that answer. And I, I suppose we can talk about the principles as well. And um, I suppose they are central um, you know, to the forthcoming, uh, forthcoming negotiations going forward in Glasgow. And I suppose in terms of the UK um, ensuring those the, those principles are basically featured, you know, in the agreement and the negotiations going forward. Um, should we, you know, in terms of the UK as well, I suppose the focus is us because we're leaving um, the EU as well, and that role um, the UK are playing in, in terms of how we're delivering that in a different aspect. Um, now that we're out with the EU, sorry, I'm going around about this. And, and the other thing is. Should it be more of a four? I'm going to be quite controversial here and say, should it be more of a four nations approach here, um, rather than UK led as well? When, when we come to that platform, yeah, I mean, I mean just to say in, in, in response to that, it, it, it is very interesting uh, that there has been far more interest in the Scottish Just Transition progress in Brussels than there has been in London uh, so, so so far. You know, I've been been at several commission related related meetings where we've talked to, talked about about what, what is happening. I mean, just to say that I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to completely agree with Dave that, uh, that in the past, just transition has featured most strongly in countries or regions that are exiting the coal industry. And it is focused very much on the issue of financial compensation. I think where, why people have been interested in the Scottish example is that we have broadened the concept of just transition. Uh, we finance, financial compensation, financial issues are really important, but the how you go about things, the way you consult and the processes are equally important. And I think that's been, been quite important uh, you know, in terms of uh, attracting attention. And the other thing has been uh, to also draw attention to the demand side of the economy and the impacts on consumers, as well as the impacts on the supply side and workers. And that has caught a lot of attention as well. 
And in some discussions I've had actually with the, the NGO group internationally, they are very interested in advanc advancing the just transition concept following some of these lines. It's not just about the supply side, it's about people, it's about places, and it's about the demand side as well. So that, I think, is why we are attracting attention, because we've broadened the concept. And actually, the fact that we were invited to be um, uh, realistic and practical has also caught a lot of attention as well. And we did actually talk quite a lot about what constituted a realistic and practical recommendation, as opposed to something that was sprinkling the magic dust on net zero, as it were. OK, thank you. Sorry, Dave, did you want to come in on that? Um, uh, just briefly, uh, the question you identified as controversial was whether there should be a, a, four, a more four nations approach, which I think you meant specifically in relation to uh, to the COP it, uh, to the COP itself. Um, uh, I mean, the answer to that, generally speaking, is yes. I mean, the things that we've run through today in terms of the high emission sectors. Um, the majority of those emissions, you know, using the back of a fag packet, are within devolved competencies. They're within housing, they're within transport, and they're within, or if not, the, the emissions may not be within renewables, but the, you know, part of the answer is in, within renewables. So given the weight of competencies, um, it would very, be very good to see a Four Nations approach. Um, Jim's comment about more interest at Europe than Westminster, I mean, I haven't seen that, but I... I guess I do have some concerns that Westminster at the moment is further behind in its understanding of a uh, of a just transition. And I guess I give two quick examples: the the disagreement with the Scottish government and the UK government over green ports, free ports, would be one um, example that concerns me. Uh, and another would be what we identify as the dilution of kind of fair work statements within the North Sea Transition Plan, which at the end of the day was a UK competency too. So you know, I mean. I prefer to be optimistic and say that the UK government has the opportunity to catch up um, on its uh, concept uh, of what just transition is and how it's uh, and how it's implemented. But I certainly don't think it's as far forward as uh, as as we are in Scotland at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Khaled. We have a couple of brief follow-up questions from members. If the panel can bear with us, we will try to keep them brief. Uh, Fiona Hislop. Uh, to be followed by Liam Kerr and Monica Lennon. Fiona. Uh, thank you. Maybe just for uh, Jim on this occasion, uh, the idea of offshoring um, and how we uh, translate that on a global basis and how the world looks at uh, the kind of, uh, what is fairness uh, in a global context. I mean, that's the big picture on, in terms of COP26. Your report mentions a uh, reference to some kind of idea of, of global carbon tax potentially for, for offshoring, but is that something that the Commission has done much work on? What are your personal views on that in terms of how do we broaden just transition, not even just to be a national issue, but um, the international dimension of it? Yeah, with my IPCC hat on, I have to say, say the internationalisation of just transition, I, you know, I think is also also, also an issue. Um, we we in one of our recommendations was about exploring, for example, the issue of border carbon. Uh, adjustments as, uh, as a way of making making sure that we to avoid the risk of, of off, offshoring industry. I have to say this is a very delicate issue to put out internationally because there are some developing countries that view border carbon adjustments as kind of pulling up the ladder in terms of development. And so I think this is this needs to be thought about very carefully to make sure that border carbon adjustments don't become a kind of mechanism for you know, establishing trade barriers that will be perceived as impeding a just transition at the very international level. So I think this needs to be thought through very carefully to make sure that it's not fair and we are not, as it were, pulling up the, the ladder on developing countries. Thank you. Uh, Liam Kerr, please. Thank you, I, I think, gentlemen, you mentioned fuel poverty in response to uh, an interesting line of questioning from Monica Lennon earlier on. The Scottish Government announced the intention to set up a publicly owned energy company uh, to both address fuel poverty and achieve net zero. Do you have a view on whether it, it would have actually achieved this in terms of the just transition principles that you've worked to? 
And having looked at this, do you have any insight as to why that ambition for a publicly owned energy company is yet to be realised? Well, if I can say, I mean, it would be great if we could have started from, from you, you know, from a, from a different place. And you know, Dave, Dave raised the, the example of the the switch from town gas to natural gas, which was achievable because we had a public energy company at the time that was doing the supply. It could come and do it in a very organised way. That's not the place that we're starting from at the moment, where a public energy company would be coming in and, as it were, competing with, with, with you know, the existing set of of private. Supply. Suppliers, so I think you know it would have helped in a perhaps helped in a niche kind of way. But I, I think you know the bigger challenge is what we do with the overall energy system and and you know the patterns of energy supply and how it is delivered to consumers. I'm sure Dave has got views on this as well. Uh, I do. Um, I um, it, the Scottish Energy Company, which was purely focused on price um, or if you like the retail side of energy may have helped a little although it would have been um, uh, uh, it would have been immersing itself in what is already a very competitive um, market our ambition for a nationally owned energy company uh, always went beyond that and was um, was was it just continues to be interested uh, in other aspects, including uh, generation, potentially um, community generation, um, ultimately and, and potentially transmission and construction too. So, whilst it might have been helpful, um, I think it's probably arguable, and I wasn't on the inside on this, that um, one of the reasons it moved off the agenda a little was because that very limited kind of retail role um, would only have done. A little bit of good. Um, I think that the main price issue remains that of um, uh, uh, the use of general taxation rather than uh, uh, direct charging to fund um, to fund future development. And for me, that's the kind of first step that we need to take if we're going to uh, bear down on uh, bear down on individual energy costs. Thank you. Thank you, Monica Lennon, with a final question from Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Dave Moxham. We've been talking about skills and jobs this morning. The Green Jobs Workforce Academy went live recently. So far, it appears to be a website where you can find a list of jobs and, and training courses, everything from a uh, wind turbine technician to HGV driver. I'm looking at the, the site this morning. What um, should that academy be doing? It's early days, but what can it do to actually help to create jobs and to help people to, to get training, Dave. Um, I have yet. Yeah, uh, thanks, Monica. I haven't looked. Um, to be honest, I just haven't had the time to look at the website or in detail. But you know what? What, what you seem to describe, you know, um, at the moment seems to be a, you know, a small green jobs labour exchange, which could potentially reduce a little bit of friction in terms of people being able to get jobs, but isn't going to um, make a fundamental impact. I mean, so what should it look like? Um, um, it should be, um, I guess, um, a portal where people who are um, engaged in, you know, the active planning of new initiatives uh, and jobs um, creation uh, and the people who are able to kind of provide the skills um, come together to, you know, to provide, a, you know, um, a portal which has real, um, uh, I guess, which has real content in it. You know, in a sense, it's only ever going to be the outward face of, um, you know, a government uh, strategy, um, which, you know, I think as we've rehearsed for the last hour and a half, you know, needs to be better funded, better coordinated, um, and part of a of a sexual plan. So, I guess I'm a little, you know, I'm not against the idea. I'm just a little bit suspicious of overemphasising the importance of something which, you know, may be slightly more effective at looking around the market, seeing what's there, and matching people to jobs, but isn't changing any of the fundamentals in terms of job creation or or the kinds of skills offer itself so you know i guess it's half a clap for it just now um but i'm not sure that it would 
ever be more than the the outward face of what needs to be you know far more hard edged fundamental policy change um, uh, to deliver on jobs and skills. That's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. And uh, finally, Mark Ruskell, please. Thanks. Uh, should the use of GDP as a measure of progress simply be stopped outright or a more transitional approach taken? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my opinion, opinion on this is uh, basically GDP ne needs to be supplemented by other measures that provide a different, uh, you know, indicator of welfare and you know, people's quality of life. GDP measures economic activity, and we absolutely need to measure economic activity to you know, undertake planning. But I do think that needs to be supplemented by other measures that uh, you, you relate to, to welfare. So no, not instead of, but as well as, would be my message on that. Dave, I don't think uh, you're still on mute, Dave. Uh, I'll ask the broadcasters to unmute you. Go ahead. Thank you. I think I've managed to unmute myself. Yeah, I mean, I'll be brief. I, uh, I, I broadly agree with Jim on that. I think certainly, particularly for the point of economic and industrial planning, then GDP, you know, isn't the measure that we need to be using. And, the, you know, the experience of the oil and gas sector and the massive disparities between GDP per capita and actual, you know, quality of jobs, community regeneration and other uh, and other things delivered uh, would bear testimony to that. So, you know, particularly, I think, across sectors, you know, we talked earlier about uh, an energy transition plan, um, you know, to use GDP as the lone measure for an energy, trans uh, an energy transition plan would be um, would be the entirely entirely the wrong approach. So while it may work, and I even say may, for some of the kind of you know macro um, uh, um, macro judgments that we make uh, when it comes to when it comes to kind of planning the transition um, in these key sectors, I wouldn't say that GDP is irrelevant, but it can sometimes be. Um, uh, it, it can sometimes be less than useful uh, and uh, 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 and sometimes uh, a negative measure to use, um, and I think that's going to become more the case rather than less as we produce a just uh, as we pursue a just transition. Okay. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of our questions. And let me just say a big thank you to uh, both uh, Jim and Dave for being with us this morning. Uh, apologies, this session has overrun slightly. Thank you for bearing with us. Thanks for your patience. I think that indicates just how useful your evidence has been in setting the scene for the committee and addressing some of the or a, a number of the uh, very important issues that, that we raised with you. So thank you once again, and we will uh, no doubt be working with you again in the future. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. The committee will now move into private session.